A very warm welcome to the second of our Westminster Abbey online contemplative seminars for Passion Tide and Holy Week, Passion and Pandemic. Today, we will consider the Poliola brothers' majestic martyrdom of St. Sebastian. Sebastian's role as a protector against plague, sharing in the passion of Christ through his own martyrdom, was celebrated across Europe in the medieval period. It's a delight to welcome as our speakers, Professor Alison Wright and the Reverend Dr. Ayla Lapine. Professor Wright is Professor in Italian Art at UCL and author of the Poliola Brothers, The Arts of Florence and Rome. Dr. Lapine is Chaplain of King's College, Cambridge, having initially trained as an art historian at the Courthold Institute. We're hugely grateful to the National Gallery for allowing us access to their collection for this series, which we hope will inspire devotion and contemplation at this time of continuing anxiety and as we begin to emerge from these restrictions. I'll now hand over to Professor Wright as she introduces the martyrdom of St. Sebastian. Whether you're fascinated by it or horrified, this depiction of St. Sebastian's martyrdom is impossible not to be struck by. As a painting, as well as an altarpiece, it's a tour de force. I'm showing you it here in its National Gallery modern frame. Firstly, there's that arresting composition, a dynamic geometry of foreground figures fitted together like a jigsaw puzzle, but giving way to a deep landscape view. Then there's its address to human violence and the instruments of war and torture. It's a painting that embraces extremes, Sebastian's passivity, the soldier's activity, physical brawn against tender waning light. There's dramatic close up and extreme depth. Having studied it over many years and researched the time of its making, it's my view that it must always have been considered a showstopper and especially when it was first installed, standing over three metres in height above an altar in a private family chapel. This was in the city state of Florence and the year we think was 1475. This was a period of great prosperity for those involved in banking and the trade in luxury goods and cloth. And there was high, high employment in manufacturing industries. This was neither a moment of political crisis though that was just round the corner, nor of health crisis. The city and its territory did suffer recurrent bouts of plague, but there was no great pandemic. Florence was still a republic at this point, but its government was increasingly under the control of the super wealthy Medici family and their allies. The commissioner of this altarpiece, Antonio Pucci, was among them. He had made his fortune as a political friend to the elder statesman Cosimo de' Medici and was, at the time he commissioned this picture, a right-hand man of his grandson, Lorenzo. Here they are, shown together with the Medici banker Francesco Sassetti in the latter's chapel, and Ant Antonio Pucci looked out, catching our gaze. The era of Lorenzo, known as the Magnificent, is a byword now for prestigious arts patronage and cultural achievement. And Pucci was himself also commissioning large domestic paintings from the likes of Botticelli, like the Medici did. And I think he was emulating them too in the choice of the Polaiolo brothers to make his altarpiece. These painters, and Antonio was also a famous goldsmith sculptor, had recently completed an altarpiece set in an up-to-date frame in the antique style for the prestigious chapel of the Cardinal of Portugal up on the hill at San Miniato al Monte. But Antonio was even better known for having painted very large mythological canvases for the Medici Palace, showing the heroic and muscular labours of Hercules. And this is just a tiny little wooden copy on, or copy on wood made by him of those lost canvases. One of the things that's remarkable in the National Gallery altarpiece is that it puts similar interests in antiquity um, and in strenuous movement into play. It represents an episode of Roman imperial persecution Sebastian was a Christian convert from the Emperor Diocletian's own army. And this is signalled here to the left by the Roman ruin. Once marking a military triumph, it now seems to be in a state of collapse with the advert of Christianity. Just as importantly, 
The whole conception of the painting's design would have offered those in the know, like Pucci, the possibility of recognising ancient figure types. Whether on rearing horses, like you can see here, or wielding their weaponry, they adopt poses like warriors on ancient battle reliefs, even as they almost all wear modern dress and even some plate armour. Part of the fascination of the painting is the way it makes Florence a kind of modern mirror of Rome. And one of its many paradoxes is how it invites you to admire such brilliantly studied bodies, anatomically ambitious and shown from deliberately difficult angles, even when the painting's function asks us to condemn the cruel and indifferent labour of these executioners. It's difficult not to find the bending figure to the right here stripped off to do his work and going red in the face as he winds his 15th century crossbow a little bit more fascinating than the saint standing somewhat limply against the dead tree. As you can see, each of the soldiers also has a partner figure for beholders to admire. The crossbowman to the left in a gorgeous red lake tunic and tights pivots the pose of his next door neighbour through 180 degrees, almost as though they're the same figure seen from two sides, and likewise grabs our attention by thrusting his bottom towards us. This is not what devout beholders expect. At the time it was made, the martyrdom of St Sebastian was intervening in a field, that of altarpiece design, in which Florence was marked out for its ambitions ever since the beginning of the century. It boasted works of great sophistication by painter friars like Fra Angelico, who's an observant Dominican, or Fra Filippo Lippi, another Medici favourite. These painters could not just tell intimate and moving stories, but make their works look like windows into a world that could be measured out in relation to the one occupied by the viewer. In the process, they set up new, often dramatic and persuasive relationships between the heavenly and the earthly realm and to the saints. The martyrdom of St Sebastian, showing the saint himself raised up against the sky and looking heavenward, denies any vision to us of that heavenly realm. There is no gold in the painting itself. And even before its removal in a restoration campaign, St Sebastian's halo was always inconspicuous. In some paintings, like the one I'm showing you here, St Sebastian was presented explicitly as a cult figure, a fashionably dressed knight whose cloak is spread out to shield unworthy mortals beneath from the vengeful arrows of plague. St Sebastian was known from the Middle Ages onwards as a plague saint, a heavenly advocate who, having overcome the piercing of martyrdom, could be prayed to to deflect the arrows of disease. And strangely, he actually survives the persecution we see in the in the Polaiolo altarpiece. The painting, which is also a narrative scene, has as its iconic centre the naked body of a youthful saint here. Though deliberately unblemished by the six arrows already lodged in him, he is yet a vulnerable sacrificial victim appearing to hang close to the picture surface. This is a young man whose features, if we are to believe the 16th century commentator Giorgio Vasari, were modelled on those of a beautiful Florentine youth, one Gino di Ludovico Caponi. If we think of the Christ-like aspects of the representation of Sebastian, there's something almost sacrilegious about this idea of his recognisability. But even if uh, we do think it's a portrait, um, and it might not be, the point of such a portrait would have been to lend an immediacy to the picture, a sense that Sebastian could act in the moment of the person praying before his image. The painting offers a window into a layered vision of several different times experienced all at once. Placed at the east end of a very large chapel, practically a small church attached to Santissima Annunziata, the picture was clearly designed to strike from a distant distance, its dominant triangle of figures pressing up right against the frame exercises an irresistible symmetry with Sebastian's head at the apex. And I'm showing you on the left here a manuscript in which the oratory of St Sebastian has just been penned in as though it's just newly built. 
and then there's a modern view of Santa Simona Annunciata to your right. This church was the site of several remarkable frescoed altarpieces, the most famous of which was a miracle working fresco of the Annunciation, which attracted pilgrims, pilgrims from all over Italy. It's one of the reasons it gained this big loggia that you can see across its facade now. Though the adjacent oratory of St Sebastian was built with private money, it still belonged to the convent and it too must have been thought of as a centre of devotion and intercession. According to a Florentine government decree of the 1450s, the newly built chapel was to be honoured with visits from high ranking guild members every year for the Feast of St Sebastian in order, and I quote, that the city should not be harmed by plague. Clearly, the government were keen to promote the cult of St Sebastian, whose feast day on the 20th of January was also the date of the foundation of a new communal regime dominated by wealthy families and the major trade guilds. Antonio Pucci would have been happy to benefit from this kind of citywide attention, even though St Sebastian was not his namesake. Sebastian's cult was thriving throughout Tuscany by this date, and before Antonio got in on the act, this was already supported at Santissimo Annunziata by a lay brotherhood dedicated to Sebastian. The friars of the church, moreover, owned a relic of the saint's arm bone. This would have been understood as an object of potential power, which, given proper veneration, might be made to work miracles too. Pucci, in fact, won the right to keep this precious relic in his chapel and provided a painted wooden reliquary or container for it, which we're told in the documents was shaped like a tabernacle raised up on a pedestal. It's sort of interesting, I think, how prominent the upper part of St Sebastian's arm is in the painting. That might be coincidental. I see the lost reliquary and the painting as mutually reinforcing. A tall reliquary looking rather like a sacrament tabernacle would have greatly enhanced the presence of the saint. It offered the sacred charisma or aura that the image alone could not, while the painting brought the saint once again to life in the landscape of 15th century Florence. Eventually, Antonio Pucci would be buried in his chapel and get the spiritual benefit of the intercession of the saint and of a large number of masses said for his own soul, those of his family and his great political patron, Cosimo de' Medici. The painting, most unusually for this date in Florence, is painted in oil. And like the Northern European works by the likes of Jan van Eyck in oil, it uses the capabilities of the medium and its transparency to represent vivid effects. The altarpiece invites us to think about painting, how it can present almost um, still life detail in the foreground here. Look at those quivers of vicious arrows waiting on the ground alongside these spiky and inhospitable plants. Or if you look up uh, at the saint, when you can easily be drawn into these deep misty distances where light is reflected from the broken surface of a meandering river. Life in the world goes on. The Pollaiola brothers nonetheless managed somehow to hold this all together with the dominating design, drawing the gaze of beholders to the face of St Sebastian at this captured moment, almost as though we too were taking aim with a bow. This metaphor of drawing the gaze like that of a marksman would not have been alien to the moment the painting was made. And it seems to be an even more intriguing analogy when one notices, as some observers have, that the dominant triangle of the foreground figures also describes a shape like a loaded crossbow pointing downwards. It seems to me that the act of looking in many forms, devout gazing, distant longing, attentive straining to judge distance, sharp and knowledgeable observation is what this painting offers as a major pictorial as much as religious theme. Interestingly, as one walks closer to the picture, um, the more the saint spanning between earth and sky, the cello or heaven, the present and the hereafter moves out of reach and the, persecu the persecutors amongst whom we stand on earth increasingly come into focus. 
what we choose to see or discern via this process of sustained looking. Do we stay on Earth looking at the panorama, looking at the body? Are we transported elsewhere? Depends, of course, on what we've come to look for or to find in the picture. It will be different for every one of us. Personally, I can't wait to be let back into the National Gallery to look again for myself and best of all, perhaps, with other people. In 1907, the poet Rainer Maria Rilke offered a poignant meditation on images of St. Sebastian like this one. And the arrows come, now and now as if they sprang from his own loins, iron quaking with their free ends. Still he smiles darkly, not yet wounded. Only once is his sorrow great, his eyes laid bare in pain until they deny something slight and mean, as if they scornfully set free the annihilators of a beautiful thing. The concluding lines of this poem, their insistence on the liberation of both Sebastian and the soldiers who pierce him with their arrows, offers a parallel between the forgiveness Sebastian offers to his tormentors and Christ's own plea from the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. In Polaiolo's painting of Saint Sebastian, the strong geometric composition encourages us not only to raise our eyes up to the exposed and isolated body of the saint, but also to place ourselves among those who focus their attention, not on Sebastian per se, but on loading their crossbows and emptying their quivers into Sebastian's flesh. Visually, this strategy brings the world of Sebastian's suffering closer to the world of Christ's. Passion Tide invites us to read the violence and pain of the Son of God's sacrifice in relation to our own sins, not as an act of self-pity, or melodramatic indulgence, but as a path towards liberation through repentance. A passage from the Book of Lamentations. Is it nothing to you that pass by? Behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. That passage is associated with Jesus' suffering and the Christian heart's response. This Lamentations text is just as relevant for Sebastian particularly as Polaiolo has raised the saint high up against the clear sky with a vast and intricate background behind him, challenging the viewer to look away. We cannot. Unlike the soldiers priming their arrows so they hit their vulnerable target, himself a soldier, now without armor or defenses, we are compelled to look upon the one who is pierced. This image is dynamism and drama epitomizes the energy of Renaissance painting. The apparent repose, even sensuous languidity of Sebastian, whose gaze is fixed on heaven instead of giving the soldiers any satisfaction with any sense of suffering, is counteracted by the pulling, preparing and bellowing even of the brightly costumed soldiers. Artists have often chosen to depict Sebastian's suffering alone after his tormentors have gone. Some depicted the saint attended by Saint Irene, who tenderly withdrew the arrows that wounded but did not kill the soldier saint. Some, like Poluolo, have shown Sebastian in the middle of his ordeal. The arrows have yet to arrive. The full agony awaits. Each category makes a huge difference to the viewer's way into the picture and to the life of the saint in relation to our own. How might we ask the saint to intercede for us, raising our hopes and needs up to God? Alone with Sebastian, we might contemplate his beauty and his pain and forge a personal relationship between his suffering and our own as we crave relief. He absorbs the arrows that would pierce our own body and soul and does so for love as Christ had done before. Saint Sebastian depicted with Saint Irene would offer a different route in prayer. 
though this could go in many directions. An introductory possibility might be to ask if we felt more aligned with the one who's been shot or the one who pulls out the arrows and seeks healing for another. With Sebastian and the soldiers together, as we have here, we are asked a far more uncomfortable question. Are we bystanders? Are we with the soldiers? Are we living through some aspect of the saints' own violence experience? As an altarpiece, Palaiolo's picture also raises important questions about the Eucharist and prayer. When the priest elevates the host during the Eucharistic prayer, it would be raised in a holy gesture towards Sebastian's own wounded body, with Sebastian himself extending his gaze heavenward. The priest in that gesture becomes the antitype of the soldiers with their arrows. Their disregard for human life, the choice of violence over love, and the desire to torture are all completely overwhelmed again and again at every Eucharist by the power of Christ's sacrifice and the frail simplicity of his body broken for all and his blood outpoured for all. The prayer often recited by the priest in our modern liturgy, all things come from you and of your own do we give you, reminds us that we live and breathe by the power of God's love and as recipients of God's own gifts alone. On Ash Wednesday, at the beginning of Lent, when the Ash Cross is marked on the foreheads of God's people, we are invited to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. In Polaiolo's picture, the soldiers are forever staring at the ground, turning away from the saint, turning away from love, loading their weapons in the act of unleashing their full quivers upon the vulnerable body of their fellow soldier. In God's dynamic love, raised up in suffering and ultimately raised up again in resurrection hope, the spiritual nourishment overwhelms these painful gestures rendering them futile over and over again. It renders the soldier's firepower powerless, just paint on a canvas, just bodies captured while in motion, their muscular forms trained for war and turned towards injustice. Sebastian too, tied to this bare tree, seems to hover in midair with an expression of prayer that seems full of uncanny assurance that the arrows of injustice are nothing in the face of God's true justice. There is perhaps no better scripture to accompany Saint Sebastian, tortured by arrows and patron saint of plague, than Psalm 91. Here's how it begins. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. With the arrows of suffering by day, pestilence by night, destruction that creates so much terror and so much suffering, all of those things are somehow vanquished through the preciousness of God as refuge and fortress, the God in whom we dare to trust, even in the most terrible of circumstances which we face today and which Sebastian faced in his own time in Rome in the third century. Polaiolo Sebastian's expression is that of one who seems somehow to know that he dwells in the shelter of the Most High. When the architect Ninian Comper 
designed this alabaster altarpiece dedicated to St. Sebastian at Downside Abbey, a Benedictine Abbey near Bath. It's little wonder that the Psalms verse about the arrow that flies by day was embroidered onto the altar frontal. This chapel is a war memorial produced in response to the First World War. When the idea for a chapel of St. Sebastian first emerged, inspiration came directly from Polaiolo's painting of St. Sebastian in the National Gallery. Another psalm is important for Sebastian's story too. In the fourth century, St. Ambrose wrote a commentary on Psalm 119. Ambrose, like Sebastian, was from Milan. Ambrose connects its verses with meditations on the Song of Songs, the love of Christ, and our participation in God through the experience of being made in God's own image. It is striking to connect Ambrose's text with a curious feature of Polaiolo's painting. In the altarpiece, there is very little space at all between Sebastian's head and the frame. It has not been cut down. The artist deliberately gives the worshiper a strange visual experience of that abrupt boundary. Though Sebastian's eyes are raised, perhaps Polaiolo's theological suggestion is that heaven is not a distant vertical destination achievable by some holy rocket. Heaven is the immersive truth of God's presence as pure love eternally. Ambrose writes, you are near Lord and all your commandments are true. The Lord is near to all of us because he is everywhere. We cannot escape him if we offend him, nor deceive him if we sin, nor lose him if we worship him. In Ambrose's same commentary on Psalm 119, he describes Sebastian's life and death in Rome, framing it in relation to the inevitability of suffering and the promise of hope. He points out, the persecutors who are visible are not the only ones. There are also invisible persecutors, much greater in number. This is more serious. We all know, especially as we look back across a year of life so destructively marred by the pandemic and its consequences, that suffering does not only come at the hands of violent soldiers. We also know, as we mourn the women who suffer abuse and worse from men who too often are not brought to justice, that persecution takes many forms. There is inner persecution too, the torments that people carry with them, the inner wounds that may lead to despair were it not for frail yet luminous hope in the love of God. In St. Augustine's On the Trinity, he explores the relationship between personhood and God's own being, and he says it like this, when the mind knows and loves itself, its word is joined to it with love. And since it loves knowledge and knows love, the word is in the love and the love in the word and both the lover and the utterer. Augustine explains this further. And so you have a certain image of the Trinity, the mind itself and its knowledge, which is its offspring and its word about itself, and love as the third element, and these three are one and are one substance. The knowledge, the love, the mind, and the unity between all these things. The medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas was deeply inspired by Augustine's idea. He described Christ as the word breathing love. Sebastian's own gaze in Polaiolo's painting, not disinterested, but disconcertingly trustful, is one of faith in the Son of God, that word breathing love. Moreover, in Polaiolo's painting, the soldiers are in contemporary dress. There are certainly important references to ancient Rome in picture, and the connections that a viewer could make, not only with the costume, but also with the faces, 
range across time in surprising ways. Perhaps they are lost on us now, but they wouldn't have been on viewers in 15th century Italy. Indeed, Sebastian's face may well be a portrait of a local young man, and that could bring the story straight into a Renaissance Italian's heart. There is a connection to be made here with contemporary artists who do the same, challenging viewers to consider connections between the old and the new and bringing the lives of the saints intimately close. It is one thing to read a saint's biography in Ambrose's fourth century commentary on a psalm or Voragine's 13th century compendium of the lives of the saints. It is another to gaze on an image that speaks immediately into one's own time. This painting by Kehinde Wiley, titled Sebastian, is from 2006. Wiley's paintings often draw on the art of old masters from the Western European tradition, involving them in a new story featuring people of color. Wiley often meets these people simply as he walks along city streets. Many refuse to have their portrait painted or to be part of his projects. Many say yes, and this young man is one of those. Taken from an image of St. Sebastian in that Western tradition, Kehinde Wiley has decided that there need be no arrows at all, but that the flowing vegetation of the background will embrace this young man's body, curving its tendrils over and around his arms in order to suggest something which is beautiful and sensual and positive rather than suffering. However, this is not an image which is free from suffering. Something about the countenance of this man, as well as the tattoos and other forms of visual culture that surround him, the way he's dressed, who he is and how he is, all of these things are comments not only personally on his own body, his self-expression, his way of being, but also on the particular pressures and circumstances of black people and black men in particular in America. The arrows need not be visible here in order for there to be the possibility of violence, tragedy and martyrdom. And so when we come back to this image of St. Sebastian in the light of Kehinde Wiley's art and in the light of what Thomas Aquinas called the word breathing love, we can make a final connection with another work of art entirely, which has a very significant parallel theological message. This too is an American artist. This is by Carita Kent, who was a nun in California in the 1950s and 60s, interacting with pop art, poetry, pop culture, and theology and scripture too. This painting, uh, this print, called Love in His Heart from 1963, includes text from a poem by St. John of the Cross. This poem, which he called a madrigal, is about Christ and the soul. The figure of Christ is explored as a young shepherd, wondering how he can dance and sing again as his shepherdess is lost. Once a young shepherd went off to despond. How could he dance again? How could he sing? All of his thoughts to his shepherdess cling with love in his heart like a ruinous wound. The root of his sorrow? No, never the wound. The lad was a lover and relished the dart that lodged where it drank the best blood of his heart. Time passed. On a season, he sprang from the ground, swarmed a tall tree, and arms balancing wide, handsomely grappled the tree till he died of the love in his heart, like a ruinous wound. What can be said of the ruinous yet glorious wound of love and its manifestation in Christ's passion is reiterated in the saintly wounds of Sebastian. One season 
the good shepherd sprang from the ground once and for all. One day in ancient Rome, Sebastian, confessing Christ in the midst of danger, was surrounded by soldiers whose pursuit of violence wounded him, but did not overcome him. I'll give the last word here to St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, as we move through Lent towards Christ's passion, death and resurrection. Paul says, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son endured the loneliness and darkness of the cross, that all people might know eternal fellowship with thee. Grant that amidst life's shadows, those who endure pain and distress may know the healing power of thy love shown through the cross, that it may be the balm of life and the pledge of eternal love for all who trust in thee. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It just remains for me to thank both our speakers for helping us to contemplate this image afresh and for being with us today. This seminar will be available on the Abbey's YouTube site after this session, and our next seminar will be premiered on Monday the 29th of March at 1.15, when Dr Jennifer Slivka and Professor Ben Quash, both of King's London, will introduce Andrea Mantegna's Agony in the Garden. May God bless you and those you love this Passion Tide.